Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the Asia Pacific Aviation because that's what I do, and uh, there's an education job to be done in terms of uh, teaching the world what Asia is about. And many of you here are based in Asia and understand from an Asian perspective, but this is what I'm saying from the point of view of one, for those of us who are based in Asia and knowledgeable about it, but at the same time, what's the message for the rest of the world? Because whether we like it or not, this industry is still driven, just from a regulatory perspective, by thinking that originated in and still resides in the power bases, the political power bases of North America and Europe. And a lot of what we do is regulatory work, I'm not going to talk about that today, but from a regulatory perspective, the rules for this industry are still driven out of Brussels and Washington. But from a commercial perspective, this is the center of the world in terms of dynamism, and fresh thinking. And this conference and predecessors to it uh, are a signal as to how this region uh, is where we're seeing the most innovation in terms of thinking about business models and evolving business models. And this morning's discussion and the panel discussion that follows uh, is going to be about something I've been talking about for a long time, which is we've got to be careful not to use oversimplistic labels and think the world can be carved up into market segments. Market segments are a way of thinking about developing products and uh, developing marketing uh, strategies. But you can't physically observe them. You can't physically observe people. You know, a passenger today is a business passenger. Next week, the same passenger is a leisure passenger. And airlines aren't so easily labeled these days. This is the rough we'll run through the topics we're going to talk about. Aviation's everywhere. It used to be a, a luxury niche um, for the rich, um, with 2.8 billion passengers, uh, 8 million passengers a day. That was about the annual throughput uh, in the early days in the 1950s. Uh, it's now a daily mass transit business. Air cargo, not a big deal for the uh, low-cost carriers. Uh, air cargo is about 1% of the tonnage of international trade, but 35% of the value. So air cargo is a $70 billion segment of the business, but it's carrying five trillion dollars worth of goods. You only know how important it is when it stops working. If you shut down aviation in Europe for a volcanic eruption and air cargo is disrupted, you find that the car factories stop, the flow of so many things disappears. So air cargo is an important part of the business, particularly for the full service carriers. And we have an outstanding safety record, which is now taken as a given. Regardless of which business model you're pursuing, there's only one safety standard, there's only one safety objective. And this industry has an outstanding safety record. The most dangerous part of your journey is driving to the airport. Now, how's the global economy doing? It wasn't much fun during the global recession. We had a big rebound, and we're bumping along at the 3 to 4%. But 2012 knocked not very comfortable because we're seeing the uh, growth rate dip. Europe's in recession. America's growing at 2% if they're lucky. Uh, in this part of the world, fortunately, we're still benefiting from what you've heard about before, which is a two-speed global economy. The two-speed global economy dates back to 2000. We've had 10 years of a two-speed global economy. The developing countries, Asia, other developing countries, other parts of the world, have been growing much faster than the developed world for the last 10 years. You see that big divergence. So when the industry, sorry, when the global economy is growing at three to four, it's really a blend of a 2% old world and a six to something percent new world led by uh, developing Asia, China in particular. But right now we're seeing a bit of a dip compared to last year's stronger recovery. Asia Pacific, big geographic area, two thirds of the world's population lives here, generates 27% of global GDP. Those two numbers tell you that people in Asia are roughly half as well off as the global average. But that conceals the fact that within that billions of population, there's a cohort of middle income people which has gone from a few hundred million 
to getting on for a billion. And one of the big drivers, the demographic drivers, is the global middle class, traditionally has been in Europe and America, North America, and it's shifting. The Asian middle class will eclipse in, in scale and in terms of purchasing power uh, that of North America and Europe. And that's one of the key drivers of air travel. As people reach middle income levels, air travel is something that they want to do and it's affordable. Whether you're an LCC or a full service carrier, we're all tapping into that changing demographic. Now, the rise of Asia is a recent phenomenon. Uh, for those of you who like a bit of history, this is a 200 year graph. 200 years ago, Asia ruled the world in terms of the economy. But the 19th century wasn't kind to Asia, and Asia's share, by the time we got to the 1950s, you see that Asia's share of the global economy has bottomed out. The Western economies were extremely strong. And what we've seen in the last 50, 60 years is a rebalancing, uh, a recovery in Asia. So now we have a situation where we have a three-legged stool, Asia, Western Europe, North America, as the three main pillars of the global economy. Obviously, aviation didn't exist in the 19th century, but aviation has been a big part of the story in the 20th century. But in the early part of the 20th century, aviation was extremely small. It's only in the recent decades we've seen just how big aviation is now. So if we take a snapshot of all the airlines based in Asia Pacific, we get this. People talk about Asian airlines having a bright future, um, in a rather patronizing way, but Asian aviation is already huge. Uh, Asian carriers are carrying 25% of global passenger traffic in RPK terms and 40% of global cargo traffic. For comparison, the US carriers are about the same size in terms of passengers as are the Europeans, roughly 25%. In cargo, we have about 40%, they carry about 20%. So this is where I support the argument that Asia is leading in commercial terms. This is not about the future, this is now. And that strength is reflected in how stock markets value airlines. These are enterprise values. Blue is equity market cap, and red is long-term debt. So if you want to get an enterprise value, add the two together. So you see that even after consolidation of the United States, where Delta absorbed Northwest, the United Continental merged, Americans temporarily off the chart for obvious reasons until they re-IPO, re and appear in some guise. But look at the numbers for Europe. Ryanair and EasyJet appear on the chart in terms of uh, rich market capitalizations, particularly Ryanair. But if you want to look at the most valuable airlines, many of them are based in this part of the world. Air China, all no Pond China region, Cafe, Singapore. So people think that because of the consolidation in Europe, in, in the majors, and the consolidation in America, that they've bred giants, and the feeling is that Asia will be potential targets for acquisition, if ever there is a liberalization of ownership control rules. What this chart tells you is if you do start thought experiments about global consolidation, don't assume that it will be America and Europe who's doing the acquiring. The people who've got money in their pocket, paper that's worth something for merger activity, is a function of what the market values put on this. This is not a complete data set. Um, so the numbers don't add up to the global totals, but it's interesting because, it, again, it emphasizes the extent to which Asian airlines have rich valuations, uh, and it's a reminder that there's a lot of debt in this business. Debt equity is roughly 50-50, probably in most cases a bit more debt than equity, because it's a tough business to make shareholder profits. But the debt capital in this business brings the discipline which we need, frankly, uh, in a business which has very, very thin margins, as I'll come on to. The blue line is cargo, the red line is passengers, volume. 
globally. Sorry, we'll go back. So you see that the passenger business had a dip during the global recession and then resumed its upward climb and is now way above where it was pre-recession. So it was about 390 and it's now about 450. So the passenger business is about 20% above where it was before the global recession. The cargo business had a terrible recession, a huge rebound in 2010. It overshot on the upside as well as the downside. And if you look at the last two years, it's flat to declining. And in absolute terms, cargo today is no bigger as an industry than it was five years ago before the global recession. Now, nobody forecast that. So during that five-year period, the red line has driven new passenger capacity into the business and a lot of belly space. A lot of new freighters have been added to the fleet, and the cargo business has gone nowhere. So right now, the cargo business is in a terrible place. Demand is extremely weak. Passenger belly is plentiful and is mopping up most of the cargo. And so people operating pure freighters have nowhere to go. You can't, unlike the passenger business, you cannot stimulate cargo traffic. It's a given demand function. If people aren't buying stuff, and if, if, if uh, retailers aren't seeing surprise, positive surprises in, in pull through, then cargo demand is weak. And that's, you know, that's a, an indication of just how tough the global economy is right now. The US economy is no bigger than it was before the recession. Europe is no bigger than it was before recession. It's only the rest of the world that's grown. China's grown 50% in the last six years. But the rest of the world is in standstill. We've got a lot of underutilized capacity for the global economy. Um, and the cargo business is a business you'd rather not be in right now. So congratulations to LCCs with narrow bodies, but the cargo is not that big a deal. But if you're a pure cargo operator, or even if you're a big full service carrier, and a lot of Asian carriers uh, represent cargo is about 20% of revenue, sometimes 30% of revenue. So when you see the Asian majors suffering, the cargo is a big part of the story. Not just for the freighter operations, but the weakness of the cargo market undermines the profitability of many passenger services. Cargo revenues dwarf profit margins. So cargo is a very important part of anybody who's operating widely. The other killer is fuel. Fuel prices are volatile. Now they're not so volatile, they're stable, but they're still extremely high. Uh, right now, fuel is about a third of your, your ticket price. If you're in the freighter business, it's 50 or 60% of your cost is fuel. So, fuel prices are right now averaging more than they did in 2008, where we had that huge spike. Fuel prices are driving demand for new aircraft. Fuel prices are destroying the capital values of old aircraft and accelerating the retirement of older types. So the fuel price has, gives you two headaches. One is the cost of filling the tank every day and whether you can recover it in the fares. But it's also having a strategic and structural impact throughout the whole industry in terms of who's got the right fleet mix and how do we reconcile the demand for new aircraft which is driven by high oil prices. But the bad side is it's destroying the value of old assets and accelerating. So the winners are the people who, for one reason or another, got out of 747 400s early, got into big twins, and who placed the orders and are taking delivery of new aircraft types because they're that much more fuel efficient. But there's more, there's more luck than judgment in that because none of us could make nimble decisions about long-term fleet, particularly when Boeing and Airbus have six-year backlog. So the net result of the industry is this industry loses money as often as it makes money. And even when it makes money, it's a very competitive thin margin business. In, in 2010, the industry had a great year, it made $16 billion. That was a 3% profit margin. On a $200 ticket, the industry took a profit of $6. Asian Airlines did a bit better, the profit margin in 2010 was about 6%. But industry that's a $600 billion industry, in a good year makes 16, and then you see what's happened is we, we halve the profits, and then we halve them again. 
and IAVA's forecast for this year is a 3 billion profit. That's a 0.5% net margin. The industry is barely at break even, above break even. <clears throat> now, Asian airlines do generally a bit better than most, so in that 16 billion, half of that was Asian airlines, and in the 8 billion last year, half of that was Asian airlines. And this year, half of that 3 billion will be Asian airlines. But Asian airlines are suffering the same pressures that everybody else is. And just because you're in a, an LCC business model doesn't exempt you from similar pressures. If you look at the uh, Ryanair results and others, um, it's, uh, it's a similar story. The fuel prices are hurting everybody. The irony is that the more efficient you are, the more fuel is as a percentage of your total costs. So if you're an efficient low-cost carrier, fuel is probably 40-50% of your total cost. If you're an efficient long-haul carrier, Singapore Airlines, fuel is 40% of their total costs. It's only the big, fat, inefficient, high-cost carriers where they can save fuel. Well, that's only one thing to worry about. But the more lean you are, the more fuel, and that's why the strategic impact of wanting new aircraft, wanting to be on the right spot in terms of young aircraft, or particularly young engines, of course, not the airframes so much, but young engines, new generation engines. So it's pretty tough right now, but uh, we're a bunch of optimists in this industry for good reason. You've seen this curve before. Everybody wants to fly. You don't have to teach them how to want to fly. Um, income is the, is the restraining force. And as people move up this curve from low incomes and very low trips per capita, you see that as people get wealthier, they want to fly and people climb up the curve. China and India are still way down the bottom left side, um, as are other countries. And as you see, incomes rising, particularly the middle-income cohort, people who are making $5,000, $10,000 a year, family income, um, really join the people who take it as a given that they're going to fly. So Airbus, uh, this hasn't been updated from the forecast they updated yesterday. Um, their new forecast says the 20-year growth rate will be 4.7, I think, not 4.8 shows you um, how much you have to adjust for the fact that things have had a blip at the moment. Uh, it's still a long-term 5% per annum, doubling every 15 years as the rule of thumb for the passenger business. And Asian growth will be somewhat faster, closer to 6%. And so you see that Asia's share of the global traffic, or Asian Airlines' share, the domicile, uh, Asian Airlines' share of the global traffic will go from being comparable, as I said, to Europe and North American carriers, to being much larger than. This is well understood, we've known it for years, it's now commonly understood, the manufacturers have uh, certainly cottoned onto this a long time ago. Uh, this is Airbus numbers looking at traffic, Boeing is no different, this is the Boeing chart for airplanes, the same story, North American fleet is the biggest, numbers are swelled by the fact they have narrow bodies and not many wide bodies, but going, projecting forward over the next 20 years, Asia is where the aircraft are going to be, and uh, the fleet size will grow accordingly. And that has implications for how many pilots and how many mechanics and so on and so forth. The Middle East is also growing spectacularly, but be realistic as to how big it is. So how do we manage our way through that? Regardless of what you label yourself, there are some pretty generic strategies you have to pursue. One on revenue, one on cost, and a key part of this business, you can't do it on your own, you have to work with partners. And in a way, this used to be a chart as to how full service carriers viewed the world, but I suspect that new age carriers, low cost carriers, have a similar strategic agenda. And we've learned from the low cost carriers to put more emphasis on asset utilization, fuel efficiency, and labor productivity, particularly in the short haul segments, otherwise you can't survive. But by the same token, when you look around the carriers in this room and in other parts of the world, who started off with a low cost model, now spend a lot of time on the top end, tailoring products, looking at ancillary revenue, looking at multiple brand strategies and so on, and alliances in one form or another, either bilateral alliances or even broader alliances. But please don't get the mistaken idea that the full service model is somehow broken. It isn't. 
premium cabins are generating 20% of, of total international passenger revenue. That's mostly business. First class is probably about 3% of that. And there is an arms race going on in terms of upgrading cabins, upgrading service, introducing new models, upgrading in-flight entertainment systems. And airlines aren't stupid. They wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't a business proposition. So the full service model is alive and well. You have to keep upgrading. You have to keep executing well in order to stay competitive. So that's going on because that's where most of the revenue is. But one of the topics we're going to talk about in the panel discussion is convergence and hybridization words that I've been using for the last five years. We're still investing heavily in premium services in the full service network carriers, streamlining short haul operations, establishing LCC subs and associates. Meanwhile, point to point LCC started off with the purest model. Some people still stick to the purest model. Others are saying, no, let's experiment. Um, today I read that EasyJet is going to roll out seat allocation system wide. They've been trialing it. They were worried about on time performance and quick turnarounds. They said it doesn't make any difference and the passengers like it better than paying a premium to be first to run onto the plane. So seat allocation is now a feature of many LCCs who traditionally said, no, we're not going to bother with that. Um, and a day hardly goes by without yet another airline to airline collaboration, often an LCC with a full service carrier. The labels are no longer very useful. And Peter's already mentioned that Emirates will never be in an alliance but that doesn't stop us doing deeply embedded metal neutral deals and changing the structure of the alliances. Because traditionally it was meant to be you did bilateral strong deals with your alliance partners. But the today's announcement cuts across that, raises lots of questions about alliance dynamics and uh, the balance of power. The other area where we see convergence, and we're going to hear from Azram shortly, is when you go into long haul and get into wide bodies, you're in the cargo business in a big way. It's not an option. You've got to be serious about it. You go for two class. No one's operating single class wide body. Look, the, uh, the charter operators tried it and failed. So everybody's two class. The discussion is which two classes, how many seats in each, and how do you make enough money out of the front end to justify differentiating? And the jury's still out on that. But because of that, when you look at wide body operations, the old LCC, FSC labels cease to have any meaning because we're all in the same business, we're all using the same equipment, and from a customer proposition, they look very similar. And the question is, what is optimized to, to match what the market needs? And the jury's still out on that. But certainly, nothing conveys the the convergence and hybridization argument more strongly than what you see with Jetstar Long Haul, AirAsia X, and others um, in that space. I said earlier that Asia is where it's happening. Uh, here's a few you're well aware of. Subsidiaries, associates. Who would have thought that JAL and Nippon would team up? Not just team up, but within 12 months we have aircraft flying. So one of the most exciting developments is you've got a couple of iconic brands, AirAsia brand, Jetstar brand, now operating in Japan. Uh, Singapore Airlines, not happy with uh, just having Tiger and uh, Silk. Silk obviously expanding very rapidly, um, have launched Scoot. And there are many other full service carriers that have subsidiaries or associates, as well as standalone LCCs. You do not see this working effectively in America, or Europe, the question is, will it work in Asia? We'll find out. Airbus um, have their own view on what uh, the relative business models will do. A couple of things to take away from this chart is that the, the business totally is going to grow from 5 trillion RPK to 12. So it's going to grow by two and a half times in 20 years. But in terms of the relative market shares, Airbus's view is the LCCs will go from about 15 to 19%. The full service global network carriers, 
will see their market share fall, but in absolute terms they will still grow. As I said earlier, these labels may not be helpful. So just to sum up, aviation is, you can't imagine life without aviation. And that's true for almost everyone on the planet now. Long-term growth prospects are a given, but the volatility will always be with us, and it's one tough business, regardless of whichever business model you're following. Asia is where it's happening in terms of customer service and business model innovation. And it's not a question of, it's not a beauty contest to pick the winning business model today. The market votes with its wallet. And the market decides which are the winning business models. It's not a business school exercise where you vote for the one you think will win. It happens every day and everything evolves to try and adjust. The question of whether you are winning, of course, is your market valuations what the shareholders tell you, as I indicated earlier. And regardless of whether you're in a full service carrier or an LCC, there's a tremendous shared optimism about the future. Because we are based in a part of the world that is not only a major aviation force today, but is going to be an even bigger force in the future. <laughs>